Welcome back to um, the second session this morning, and thank you very much to Ethicon for asking me to, to chair the session. Um, I'm, I'm going to look bad compared to my previous chairman because I don't have some slides to introduce the, uh, the, the, the session, um, but hopefully I'll get away with it because they've made me talk as well as uh, 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 chairing it. As the morning has been um, all about aortic valve uh, surgery, and we're going to one of the, the, the techniques that's been growing in, um, uh, in popularity has been minimally invasive surgery. And what I'm planning to do is to describe what we've been doing in Middlesbrough and the techniques that we've been using, uh, and then ask Matteo to, uh, to describe uh, the experience from, from Italy, um, which is going to be basically where we went off in Middlesbrough to learn uh, most of the techniques that we now use. So um, I suspect there may well be quite a lot of crossover between uh, what we're doing uh, in Middlesbrough um, and what we're going to hear from the, the experience in, in Massa and in, in Milan. But, uh, We'll take some questions at the end, but if there's anything that's more appropriate for discussing with the two of us, we'll defer that until after the, the second talk. So what I've been asked to talk about is one of the versions of doing um, aortic valve replacement, and the version we do in Middlesbrough is limiting the incision just to the manubrium, um, as we'll, we'll uh, come on to. Well, what I was going to plan to talk about, why, why are we doing minimally uh, invasive aortic valve replacement? Um, what, what does it actually offer? And then we've been, have been given a grant to actually start doing a randomised trial in Middlesbrough, um, which we've been running now for just over a year. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be able to present you the results of those today, but basically what we're looking at, and we'll see the, the data, there's, there's a lot of units doing minimally invasive aortic valves, but there's very little randomised data out there on the benefits uh, of, of doing this sort of surgery. Uh, and as we've been hearing this morning, aortic valve, when I was a trainee, the, the only one of the, the, the options available was the top of this list. The only, yeah, you, as, as David said earlier, you could open the sternum, put them on bypass and, and stitch, in, stitch in a new valve. But the degrees of minimising the trauma to the patient, whatever, has changed dramatically over the last five to ten years. And what was pretty much, I mean, if we were stood chatting about aortic valve surgery ten years ago, most of these things were just on the horizon, but they weren't being practiced, whereas now they're almost completely, the, the, most of this list has now become completely uh, routine. So it's been a very evol rapidly evolving field over the last uh, few, uh, few years. And when we talk about minimally invasive aortic valve replacement, one minimally invasive AVR is not the same as somebody else's minimally invasive AVR. The first descriptions actually go back to 1996, and Cosgrove um, took out, I think he described seven cases where they took out the costal cartilages, um, which must have hurt a hell of a lot, but it's a very good uh, description looking back, and some of the things he describes um, are now become widely, widely practiced, but that was seen to be the earliest descriptions. There's quite a lot of people doing stenotomy via the fourth space. Um, it's not really, well, people call it a hemi, but you land up just dividing the two-thirds of the sternum to do a hemi a stenotomy if you go down to the fourth space. The people doing clamshells and transverse stenotomies, um, there's a move towards doing smaller incisions, avoiding the stenotomy, and something we'll hear about later, and uh, doing, doing the operation through a thoracotomy, trying to avoid, uh, avoid doing the, the, dividing the sternum altogether. And the, this one which we've, we've chosen uh, to go with in Middlesbrough is, is just going down to the second space, so just dividing the manubrium. <laughs> so there's lots of, you know, a mini AVR isn't just a mini AVR, depending on where you, who you talk to. Why are we doing it? What are the advantages of doing the um, doing this sort of surgery? As we've heard earlier, the, the patients coming for aortic valve replacement are getting older and older. Uh, it's quite common now to be getting patients 80, 85. And they're not the 60, nice fit 65-year-olds that might have been having the surgery uh, 20 years ago. So we're trying to reduce the, the, the pain, we're trying to reduce the complications that we see, trying to get them up out of ITU quicker, trying to get them out of hospital quicker, reducing the costs of having the operation. Um, trying to get them, to get the physios getting them out of the bed faster, better respiratory function, all these sort of things. And from a, from a, a salesman's perspective, the patient comes to see you, uh, not that we're selling things because in the NHS, but uh, patients love small incisions. If you ask the patient whether they want a big hole in the chest or a little hole in the chest, you'd be surprised to hear that last survey, 100% chose the smaller hole. And we did actually ask that question. <laughs> One of our nurses did a, did a study and 100% chose a small hole. <coughs> so yes, patients, patients come to us having Googled it, wanting a, a little incision. And that may well be one of the main drivers for why we're doing it. 
So why did we choose the second space uh, rather than the fourth space? So I've already said there's quite a lot of papers out there. I think if you um, um, do PubMed searches, there's, there are at least 50 publications on, on, on mini-AVR. But actually, there are only, I think there's four randomized trials uh, using the, the fourth uh, space. And actually, there's not a lot of benefit. There's slight reductions in blood loss and a few other bits. But uh, there's very, very little benefit seen compared to doing a conventional stenotomy in, in the randomized studies. All the non-randomized studies tend to show a benefit. Um, but the, the randomized ones don't. Why didn't we choose a thoracotomy? Um, our feeling was when we were starting out, it was going to be a harder operation to do. Um, so harder to learn. It's not applicable. You can't do every single patient through a thoracotomy uh, unless the aorta's more displaced to the right side. It can be very tricky to do the valve replacement of the aorta's more over to the left. Um, so you can't do 100% of the patients coming through. Well, having said that, the thoracotomy may hurt less and may be cosmetic cosmetically more superior. So there are benefits possibly theoretically to doing the thoracotomy. But, but when we were setting out um, on this about four years ago, the second space seemed to be uh, the, 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 the incision of choice for us. And why did we like it? We, we felt it was a truly minimally invasive procedure. You can do the, the operation through a four or five centimeter hole. It's the same incision as you use pretty much to do a, a transaortic TAVI procedure. Uh, and as we heard earlier, we're competing not only with conventional AVR, we're competing with uh, cardiologists putting in, in TAVI valves. Uh, so if you can say, well, we can do a proper surgical replacement of the valve through the same cosmetic uh, incision, the same recovery time as if we were doing a, a, a TAVI implant, why wouldn't you cut the valve out and implant it surgically and doing it properly or what the surgeon would consider to be properly? So that was one of the benefits. We thought it would be applicable to nearly 100% of the patients coming through our program. And because it's closer to a conventional AVR, we didn't think it would be as hard to learn. Pre -op, I mean, the, the pre-op, I mean, how do we assess the patients? Actually, I mean, they're coming for an aortic valve replacement. You assess them exactly the same way as you do anybody else. Most of them, the ones which need to go through the TAVI, MDT, if they're considered to be at high risk. The only additional test that we do, which we weren't routinely doing before we started the programs, they all now get a pre-op CT. Um, that's picked up a number of undiagnosed ascending aortic aneurysms, which feeds into the, the talk we had earlier. Um, so yeah, occasionally you land up doing a root replacement rather than a, an AVR. And those used to be surprise findings when we opened the sternum in the, the past. You got in there and suddenly there was a 49 millimeter ascending aorta, which the cardiologist had quietly failed to mention on the referral letter or hadn't been able to see on the echo. So that gets picked up quite a lot. It's very applicable for, if you're going to do a thoracotomy, it's very important because you need to know that the, the aorta is to the right side of the sternum. But even if you're doing it through the second space, you can actually measure the distance from where the incision is down to the aortic valve. Um, and the guide, guidelines seems to be, as a rough um, rule of thumb, is it needs to be less than 10 centimetres. And we went out to watch <coughs> Professor Glauber do this operation. I said, why 10 centimetres? And he said, because that is 10 centimetres long. You need to be able to tie the knots with your finger. And that was the, the reason he gave me when we went to visit. And we've stuck to, you can, of course, do it when it's 11 or 12 centimetres. But the closer to the, closer to the, um, from the space to the, to the aortic valve, the easier the operation tends to be. And that's just, dem this is just demonstrating that. So the measurement of 10 centimetres, just from the, the top of the, um, the third costal cartilage, so the, the bottom of the second space down to the valve, if that's less than, um, less than uh, 10 centimetres, that seems to make the, the operation easier to do. And you can also measure the depth. And this, this one allows you to see whether the aorta is, how much of the aorta is to the right side of the sternum. If you're doing it through a stenotomy, the mini stenotomy doesn't really matter. But again, if you're doing the thoracotomy, you want more of the aorta over to the right. So the incision, you start in the normal place at the sternal notch. But instead of going obviously down to the, the diphoid, you just stop, at, uh, stop in the second space. I was very skeptical about the cosmetic benefit of doing this. I mean, it's the bit that you can see. And the ladies, it's the bit that you can see at the top of the, uh, the, top of the dress. The men, if they're not wearing a tie, it's the bit you can see above the shirt. But uh, having said that, patients still like the cosmetic scar they get, the fact that it's much shorter. Um, so yeah, the, there must be some cosmetic benefit, but um, yeah, it is, it is the, the bit at the top of the wound which is, it is most visible. And this diagram's not quite right, but what you, the, the principle of doing it was you actually cut a V, so you go to the top of the cartilages, the, 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 unfortunately the illustrator 
put the, the cut halfway down the, the second space. But to, make, to get every bit of length that you can so you can see clearly go right to the top of the, uh, the third cartilage. And if you make a V incision, not too sharp, uh, but a, just a, a shallow V, um, that again gives you another few millimetres of view, which is the bit you need to see. And when you come to put the sternum uh, back together at the end, it gives you more, more of a key to put the, uh, to put the sternum back together. So all these little tricks seem to help when you're, uh, help, um, when you're putting things uh, together. Fewer problems with sternal instability, for example, uh, which is one of the problems if you transect the sternum, there's a concern that we were going to get sternal rocking, which it doesn't seem to be a, a problem that we've seen. The cannulation, arterial cannulations, just as you normally do, you just cannulate the, um, the, the, the bottom of the arch uh, with your normal cannula. If you're going to do it through the, sm the smaller hole, if you're going through the bigger hole, the fourth space, you just put a standard two-stage venous pipe in because you can see the hole in the heart pretty much if you're going through the fourth space. Um, but through the second space, you do need to do femoral venous cannulation. And the pipe that we've found to be the best to use is this, um, this Medtronic 22 French cannula. It's all put in under a guide wire uh, with uh, TOE imaging. And we, with, a, with a bit of suction from the perfusionist, we, we, we get fantastic drainage and you can get Whereas femoral bypass used to be an absolute pain when I was a trainee and the perfusionist moaning at you for the whole case. With these new, uh, new pipes, they're so used to doing it for things like mini mitrals, we get proper, proper drainage without the perfusionist whinging the whole case. And the thing, you, you, your anaesthetists need to be, well, all the anaesthetists these days are very happy doing TOEs, but you need to get them to give you a good bicaval view. When you just insert the guide wire up, you have to just see the guide wire going across into the SVC. Um, these pictures should be the other way around, really. But, and then once you've got the guide wire up into the SVC, you just feed the pipe, pipe up under, un, under, under vision with the anaesthetist just telling you in the right place. And you just need to see these holes in the side of the pipe going up into the, uh, going up into the SVC. And obviously there's some holes in the IVC. So it does give you proper bicaval drainage. It's a, it's a very, very good pipe to use. The venting, we've been around the houses uh, with venting. When I start my standard way of venting uh, an aortic valve, uh, when I left Papworth, I used to shove a, a sucker through the LV apex. And I eventually grew out of that after a few years, so I have changed uh, a bit. And I then just, just dropped the, uh, the, the sucker through, um, just the sucker through the aortic valve. And I, the first 10 or 15 cases I did this way, you can do it, but then when you get a difficult one and you're struggling to see and you've got a sucker through the, through the hole, um, and you're cursing away because there's blood coming up. We did find that we had to move to trying to get the, the, the vent out of, out of the surgical view. The superior pulmonary vein vent you can sometimes get in, but it's quite tricky through the, the, sec the, the second space, um, but it gives you very good drainage. Um, my preferred route now, I'm just very old-fashioned, fa like um, we've gone back to just using pulmonary artery vents, and that seems to work extremely well. And there is a device, just like a swan, you can actually get the anaesthetist to float your percutaneous pulmonary artery catheter. Um, we did have a, we had a play with those for about six or nine months. They're quite expensive, and the drainage wasn't that brilliant with them. There didn't seem to be any particular advantage over just doing an old-fashioned slash in the PA and drop the sucker in. The great thing about doing it through a minimum stenotomy is this bit is how you normally do it. There's nothing. You just cut the valve out and stitch it in. Um, we started off using normal instruments. I've taken to actually using, uh, we had masses of mitral, great long knitting needle instruments because we were very active, minimally invasive mitral program. And I had a case that was quite tricky to do, again, maybe 15 or 20 cases into the program. And we got the, the longer needle holders out. And once I'd started using the knitting needles, and my fist wasn't in the way as I was putting the stitches in, I found they were easy to use. And I've started using those for everything now. So if you've got them, they're great. But if you haven't, you can just use your normal needle holders to put the valve in just as, you know, so there's nothing special about putting the valve in. When it comes to de-airing, you can't do all the manoeuvres, all the normal shaking and lifting the heart up. Um, so again, something I never used to use, but uh, now we use CO2 for every case. Um, the TOE, that you have to get the anaesthetist to tell you where the air's out rather than seeing it all coming out. Um, you just have to use your vent site. Remarkably though, whereas you, when you open the chest, there seems to be air everywhere. When you're doing it through a little hole, when you take the clamp off, and there hardly ever seems to be that much air in there. So what I thought was going to be a really big problem when we started doing it, I couldn't see how I do all my normal manoeuvres. I don't do them, and it doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to matter. Um, this is something that's slightly different. It's a pain to get the pacing wires on. The only way uh, to get the... Once the, once the cross clamp's on, you'll never see the ventricle again. 
Uh, so you've got to get the ventricular wires on while the heart's collapsed. So you put the pacing wires on before you take the clamp off. Um, the atrial ones usually get pulled off while you're doing something else if you put them on. So I've stopped bothering to put atrial pacing wires on. You don't. You rarely seem to need them. If, you, if it's really very slow, you can put some atrial wires on, but we don't routinely bother. And there's some debate if you really can't see, do we actually need pacing wires, which breaks one of the golden rules I was given when I was in SHA. You always put pacing wires on somebody after valve replacement. Uh, but golden rules seem to be broken when you can't do them. So, <laughs> And the drains, likewise, we've been around the houses trying to go through the side of the chest and all the rest of it. Well, the first time I saw it, somebody putting in a sub drain on bypass, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to shove the drain through the liver, through the front of the heart. But actually, it's by far the easiest thing. It's just to get a long Roberts, make the incision in the right place, and just ram the, the Roberts up. And when the heart's collapsed, it's actually very easy to put them in sub -zifoid. And the closure, as I said earlier, the V-shaped stenotomy is very helpful because I think it gives more transverse stability. And it's just a couple of wires in the manubium, and then you just put a couple of cross wires uh, across where you've uh, divided the sternum. So what are the, uh, the results? These are quite old data because I'm not allowed to, since we started doing the trial, I'm not allowed to show you the data from the, the more recent patients. Um, but these are the data we collected at the outset. These are the very first patients we did when we were trying to set up the, the study that we're now doing. Um, but we looked back over 18 months and there were two of us, myself and Eno Akawa, we um, were doing the minimum invasive and we compared ourselves to our five colleagues who were doing the conventional AVRs. So this is a completely non-randomised but it's one unit's, uh, one unit's data over, it's a consecutive series of patients over an 18 month period. And we were busy pinching all the AVRs obviously because two of us managed to get over half the cases. Um, did help the fact that I did all the TAVI MDTs so I could coin all the ones out the, the, uh, the, the TAVI program that needed surgery. They're very well matched. The only thing that was slightly different was the, the classification on our database of whether they had mixed um, pathology or stenosis. Seeing as I, I tend to classify everybody that's got aortic stenosis as just having stenosis, I don't usually bother classifying them as having mixed. Um, and obviously my colleagues classify them slightly differently if they've got mild to moderate MR, uh, AR rather. Um, so we think that's just, that that's just a surgeon coding thing. But if you look at the number of regurgitant valves, there's only one or three percent in the two groups. So we, we, they're pretty, pretty similar group of patients. The LV function was the same. Um, because I was going to the TAVI MDT, some of them are, they were landing up in the, in the mini group largely. Um, but the Euroscores are, uh, are very similar. As everybody finds who does this, it takes longer to do a minimally invasive AVR. Not hugely so. Um, when we were starting out, it was taking probably half an hour longer, although the times have come, the times have come down quite a lot. The cross-clamp times are about, I think, seven minutes, six or seven minutes, uh, the difference between doing it um, uh, open versus conventional. The results we saw post-op were very similar. Um, the, the inotropic usage, there was a trend towards them being extubated earlier with the mini AVRs, um, but when you take out the long, um, the long stays on ITU, that, the time to extubation was actually very similar. Um, the thing we found was blood loss was a lot less. Um, so 280 mils versus 400 mils, and that was statistically significant. And the number of patients bleeding more than 500 mils was much greater uh, in the conventional group compared to the, to the uh, mini group. Um, the number of patients needing blood transfusion, not surprisingly, was much higher in the mini group, sorry, the conventional group compared to the mini, and the same for blood products. Interestingly, the reopening rate for bleeding was much higher in the, in the, um, in the mini group compared to conventional. So on the basis of that, we were quite excited that we, and because the, the, there's a sort of dearth of data out there, no big randomised study um, looking at, looking at um, uh, mini-AVR. Uh, we've managed to secure funding to do a single centre. It is a blinded, it's a single blinded, obviously can't be double blinded, trial of, of open versus, uh, versus mini-AVR. And the patients have their dressings on for, uh, for two days following the surgery and don't get told until day, day two what procedure they've had. Uh, and interestingly, the blinding does seem to work. A lot of them can't, you know, when, you, when we ask them, they don't seem to be able to tell um, through the big dressings. It's blindingly obvious to anybody looking after them from where the drains and the, the um, pacing wires and things come out, but obviously the patients, patients don't know which one they've had. 
Um, so we're hoping we will get some good data, get good data out from this trial. Um, so the, the inclusion criteria, basically it's every AVR coming through the unit in Middlesbrough. Um, we're excluding people who can't have blood transfusions uh, and people with uh, infective endocarditis. And we've excluded the sort of the very high risk, the redos in the emergency cases. But otherwise, it's pretty much everybody that's coming through. The reason why we're excluding the, um, the, pe the, the hematological problems and the Jehovah's Witnesses, because the, the primary endpoint is, is a blood transfusion after seven days, um, in the first seven days. And the secondary endpoints, basically we're measure, measuring everything, but uh, we're looking at blood product usage, trying to look at quality of life, trying to look at cost of the NHS, both in terms of hospital stay and cost effectiveness. There are some costs with doing the procedure. The, 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 the venous pipe, for example, in the femoral, uh, the femoral venous pipe costs more than a standard pipe, so there are extra costs, and will those be offset by the reductions in, in length of stay? So we're trying to analyse that as one of our major, major endpoints. Uh, we've got funding for three years. Uh, we started um, just over a year ago. As of yesterday, we've done 145 patients, um, and the recruitment rate, I think, is 94% of all AVRs are coming through the unit, having set ourselves a target to recruit 70%. Um, we've obviously been more persuasive than we, than we thought we would be. Um, there's a sign here, you won't get your operation otherwise, sort of type consent process. No, no scrub that bit. Um, but the, yes, the, the the patients love the, the thought of getting, love the thought of getting a minimally invasive procedure, and um, the only way you'll get in a minimally invasive procedure um, in the hospital now is to be part of the trial. You can't, if you ref refuse to take part of the trial, the ethics uh, department basically said that we had to provide what was considered to be the gold standard treatment, which is the, the conventional stenotomy. And we're trying to find, we've, as I say, we've done 100, 145 as of yesterday, and we're trying to find 260. So hopefully we're going to finish. Amazingly, for a research trial, we're hoping to finish early. Um, I don't think well, we won't have the results this time next year, but we should have just be finishing uh, the recruitment. And then, just finally, having one of the, the um, having started doing the um, all my aortic valves through the small hole, um, I do quite a lot of aortic root surgery. Um, we've now I've now done 24 uh, aortic root replacements through the same incision. Um, so. Uh, you can either use the second space or if it's looking tricky on the CT scan, we sometimes go down to the third space. Um, and as you can see, you can actually, you can see the whole of the aortic, you can see from the, the bottom of the aortic arch down to the, uh, down to the top of the RV outflow track, all that fat that you need to see. Um, and so you can still dissect the coronary buttons off and do the full procedure just as you, you would do normal. So it's a very, a very conventional um, dental procedure, but done through, done through the limited incision. Uh, and this, again, is increasingly becoming the standard treatment um, uh, for somebody who's having a, a full root replacement. And that was the end of what I was going to say. <laughs> Any questions, on, burning questions on that, or do you want to <coughs> defer them till after the... Did the picture you showed us show the uh, conventional venous cannula? Is that for the roots only, or is that your beginning and you move to the percutaneous venous drainage? We've never done conventional. These pictures, what was there? Is that the vent? Uh, which one? The, uh, the last one. The last one. Oh, last the, root, one. the root one, yeah. Oh, well, the root one, uh, it'll be a vent. There's, there's a. Where is it? Next to the this this suction, that's yeah. the vent that's a pulmonary vein vent. Okay. Cross clamp is here. Aortic cannula is there. Okay. Thanks. So yeah, so yeah, you to to if you start putting venous pipes <coughs> into this in the, the smaller incision, you'll just land. It gets right in the way of what you need to see. So the femoral venous pipe, especially for people doing TAVI, putting a guide wire into the femoral vein is is very straightforward and easy to do. Um, your Anesthetists need to be happy getting the bicaval view, and some of our anesthetists are better than others. At, um, the ones who are fully TOE accredited are very good at it. The ones who are very good at looking mitral valves when you've done the repair and things, but not quite used to doing the full uh, image set sometimes. But they, they struggle sometimes. But even those, now we're doing so many of them, they've got used to finding the views that we need. So, um. It's on, but oh, yes, it is. Um, just wanted to ask you: uh, Have you experienced any uh, difference in 
pain, post-operative pain, because we actually did. Uh, so because of uh, um, a short uh, short section of the of the sternum which is divided uh, we were uh, we pushed ourselves to probably spread the the, 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 the the two portion of the of the sternum probably too wide uh, compared to a normal stenotomy and in some cases this led to uh, moderately higher postoperative pains what's your what's your experience I mean, you can you can jack the retractor in really tight, uh, really hard, and I, I'm yep. sure that you can land up with rib fractures, and yeah, the strain on the upper part of the uh, the sternum is not going to be great if you overdo it. We've not seen major problems. Um, we're doing visual analog score pain and analgesia use as one of our outcome measures uh, for the for the for the study. Whether we'll show any, whether we we'll show any difference. Um, anecdotally, we're not seeing. They're not seeing uh, an issue. Um, the thing that surprises me is something yeah, that when it goes well, the, the patients do go home, do seem to go home a day or two quicker. They, they do seem to be less, I think they have less pain, my, would be my impression, but uh, actually demonstrating that is incredibly difficult to, uh, to do. This retractor, no. We, 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 use, we use a little esh -tech retractor because it's got the small blades. Yeah. You, although you can use a, a, a standard sort of mini finichetto uh, type retractor. So to in the trial, they have different... Yes, yes. You, this, this, is, um, this has got bendable arms, so you can... There's an arm here which you can flex up and it gets out of the patient's way, of the, out of the way of the neck. So it's a very useful little... Uh, if you've got one, they're, they're great, but you can actually do it with a bog standard small, uh, small sternal retractor. Um, we use a whacking great retractor for the standard stenotomy. Great big things like something out of the dark ages. And my other question is about the, the bleeding. Do you think you had a lower threshold when you were starting off to, to return from bleeding rather than left I suspect it was because I was. That changed over time. Um, they point at the surgeon who was doing the mini stenotomies as having a high reopening rate for bleeding. Um, you, they, if they tamponade, they tamponade quickly. Yeah. Um, We've had a couple that have had to be open quite fast on ITU because you've only got a little hole and the pericardium is all, almost entirely shut apart from the bit you've opened over here. Um, so he's, with a conventional stenotomy and the pleura is open, you can lose a litre and nobody will notice. Um, with this, 100 mils in the pericardium that's not come out down the drains, they can go downhill quite... You've only got one drain. And you've only got one drain. Um, so we, we did have, early on, we had a, two or three that opened quite, quite rapidly and a couple of them had got, got opened on the ITU. Um, as time's gone on, that, that's become much, much less of a, an issue. Yeah. Well, what was the rationale for choosing that competition? Because it was the most significant thing, and it got the, 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 when the statisticians did it, it was the thing that got us the smallest N number for the study. So, um, so yes, it's probably the least useful measure. Um, but to try and get national fund, yeah, it's NIHR funding study, you, you've got to have a... We couldn't do 1,000 patients. We thought we'd struggle to get 260. I'm, I'm astonished the recruitment's gone so quickly. Um, so maybe we should have been more ambitious of using a different end point. But uh, the mortality was, I think, 1% in one group and 2% in the other. So we're never going to show a mortality benefit. We're never going to, the stroke rates are 1%, so we're never going to show that. Um, if we, we weren't sure, we'd not measured pain as a, we didn't have any raw data on pain to try and use that or respect. We've gone around the houses trying to look at ways of assessing respiratory function. We're getting the, the physiotherapist to do all sorts of different respiratory tests on them post-op and, and time to get them up and around and time till they walk up the flight of stairs and various other rehab things. But they're all quite soft, all quite soft measures. Uh, and statisticians like nice big numbers where there's a big difference so they can give you an N um, and your, yeah, your power calculations. But you sell the operation to the patient you sell it to if I told the patient they were going to bleed 125 mils less, they probably wouldn't be that excited when it's only half a, half a cup of water, isn't it? Um, the patients, patients tend to come to us wanting it. The main, I'm amazed on the power of Google. I, w I wouldn't be surprised if two-thirds, three-quarters of my patients have Googled me or the operation before they see me these days. And they've heard of, mini, they've heard of mini AVR. They know how many patients I've killed in the last three years. They know what I look like. They say, oh, you look young. <laughs> compared to your photograph or whatever the comments you yeah, it, they've, they've clearly them or their relatives have looked you up so um, so yeah the patient 
patient choice is then, having been a skeptic that cosmetically it was much better because you know, for a lady it's the bit you can see, but they still want it. And they like they like the, they like the incision. When we explore bleeding, do you have to go through No, but yes, we have had to convert quite a few. Um, when we were learning the first fifty, I think we opened four of the first fifty cases we did. So what's eight eight percent? And we quote, I still quote, 10% conversion rate uh, to open. Um, the reality is it's much, much less than that. But that's what, when I'm telling the patients there's a risk, we're, we're trying to do you through a little hole, but if I can't, I'll just convert you to doing it the normal way. Um, they're very accepting of, accepting of that. The only downside of converting it is you'll end up with four bits of sternum because you've chopped, <laughs> chopped it in half. And then, um, but we haven't had that. I thought that was going to be a big issue with lots of rocky sternums falling apart, but so far, touch wood, that hasn't been a, that hasn't been an issue. Can I ask about definitions? What, what is a minimally invasive uh, approach? Because you hear it for the first you, line. I mean, I think you're doing it, but you hear uh, plenty of people going all the way down to zippy sternum, a small skin incision, saying that's minimally invasive. Yeah, there's everything from people doing small skin incisions but dividing the whole sternum and trying to do it through a, a little skin incision. I don't think that's minimally invasive. It's cosmetically better, possibly, but uh, you're just making the operation hard for yourself and giving the patient all the trauma. Um, when we're going to come on to yeah, trying to avoid dividing any bone at all, is that the, the way to go for minimally invasive surgery? Um, we like the fact that it was close as close as possible to doing a normal AVR, but you're only dividing maybe a third of the sternum as opposed to that's what's called a hemistenotomy. Going down to the fourth space is two, effectively two thirds, of the, two thirds of the sternum if you go down to the fourth space. So, um, but for our data submissions, I feel quite strongly there should be clear definitions here. What, what would you advise? I don't think, I mean, if you look through, the, you look through what's published, nobody, nobody agrees. I don't think there's a, a definite. People call off-pump surgery minimally invasive coronary surgery. I mean, you can't get much more invasive than chopping your chest open. Just because you're not using bypass, it's still maximally invasive. If you want minimally invasive surgery, you need to have a TAVI or a PCI. <laughs> well, you've done through a one centimeter hole in your leg. How, mu how much less invasive do you want to be? Do you prefer the same length? Yes. Yeah. Um, I just do a simple. Simple single suture continuous, so for four hour stitch. I do a, tr I do a very l relatively low um, transverse aortotomy right on the sign of tubular junction, and usually transect about two thirds of the circumference. Um, but that's exactly what I was doing before I changed to doing this. Um, I was, I was, a, I was a mini skeptic when I went out to Massa to watch these operations being done. Like my colleague Mr. Aku was really enthusiastic, and I went along with him to. Uh, to have a look and sort of see, and I came back enthused that I could actually do an operation that I would just consider normal for what I would do, but I'm doing it through a smaller hole. The bits of doing it through the small, the only thing that difference is you make a little hole and you put a pipe in the groin. Otherwise, the operation is what you do day in, day out. Um, and in, as a concept of learning, as, as making the jump to going towards the invasive, those were two fairly easy steps to make. You start doing robotic <coughs> mitral rep repair through tiny holes with femoral venous cannulation and cameras up here and lots of funny instruments and balloons into aortas. You're making so many steps which are so different from what you would do day to day that that's difficult to learn. Whereas doing, doing this, you've got to teach people two new steps from what they, normally, from what they would normally do. But the penis pipe can take the penis? Yes, yeah. And pull. Pressing. You have an SCP, it presses on it for 20 minutes. Um, it's very... The, the joy of putting it in percutaneously is it takes, you know, the wire, the guide wires take seconds to put in. Um, and taking it out takes seconds. You just have a very bored SCP looking at the clock. But that's much, 20 minutes somebody pressing on the groin is much quicker than you cutting down and doing four more repairs. And, and actually our mitral program has had much more problems cutting down onto the vein, femoral vein complications than we, uh, we've had, we have, I was going to say, we, I could have said three months ago, we've never had a femoral vein complication. We have now had a, a femoral vein uh, tear, uh, which we've had to sort out as a result of doing femoral percutaneous cannulation. Um, but we've done yeah, 250 plus of these now, so it was something we'd never seen, whereas we were seeing that with cut downs with the, the mitral bones. Can you use a prostar on the femoral vein? No, we don't. No, we've never. 
don't know whether you could. Would the ProStar work on the? Well, it's what we use for. It's what we were using for Tavi, but I don't know whether that's. I don't think anybody's using it for Venus closure. No, no, so, 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 so. This is just one view. The other thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, you, you said in the initial experience there were two surgeons doing the memory and basic transfusion doing the conventional ABR? Uh, the other five were doing conventional. Well, uh, now with this trial, what do you do when you randomize the patients? Do you, do you do the conventional or do you do the we, surgeons We quickly trained a third colleague to do it, um, and now all the ABRs in the unit go through those three surgeons. So I colleagues have agreed to give up all AVRs for three years. Um, so yes, the all every AVR comes through one of the comes through one of the three surgeons. So it's randomized. I, I either do open or mini. Whereas when I that data we showed I, they were all minis, I was doing all mini, but I now do half and half. Uh, and Mr. Akua and Mr. Owens. So that the three of us are running the program and the other surgeons have agreed. Uh, so they get valve and grafts but they don't get all the AVRs come come. So that was one of the things that's made, we initially wrote the protocol that two of us would do the minis and the other five would be, if it was randomized to open, the other five would do that. But the, the funding body, the two things they made us put in was they wanted the patients to be blinded, which we said was impossible, but actually that seems to have worked. Uh, and the other thing, we thought we'd never get our colleagues to agree to giving up all their AVR practice. And we sat in the surgeon's meeting over a cup of coffee one morning and they all said, yeah, that's fine. I thought, oh. So we, we came, out, <laughs> came, came out of the meeting with exactly what... Uh, so thought, well, you can have all the AVR and grass on the door, the nice straightforward AVRs. I mean, you actually work. What stage do you actually randomize? When, when do you decide? When is the pull of the card? The, the, they get randomized. Um, they, they get randomized about 24 hours prior, prior to um, prior to theatre. So they come in. They either come in the day before, or they come to a pre-admission clinic, and they're consented, and then they're randomized. And we've been very careful to not let the patients get wind of what they're having because we don't want any. I think if people get find out they're going to have a, an open, they might withdraw. So um, we've been very careful not to. Um, the theatre staff, initially we thought of randomising in theatre, but the theatre staff weren't happy because they have to have VATS camera, the, the VATS um, screens and stuff to get all the kits slightly different. So they, they wanted more than two minutes warning that we were going to change the operation. So I might, unless there's a burning question, I think we need to move on to moving on to the. Uh, yeah, one. Which, one Do you want to, yeah. which, which operation do you prefer doing? I prefer doing the mini operation. And if it was me having the operation, if I could do it, I'd have the mini operation. <laughs> um, I wouldn't, wouldn't want a, a colleague who doesn't like doing mini surgery doing it. But actually, if once you get your head around it and you like doing it, I think it's a better, the better operation. Hand on heart, do I think my, the, the study we're doing will show you a, a big benefit of big hole versus little hole? I suspect not. And I think then there's another trial that's been going on at Patworth. They're using the fourth space. Uh, my, my reading between the lines, I suspect the Patworth trial will, will show no benefit either of big hole versus little hole. Um, yeah, so. Anyway, in the interest of time, we better move on.